Hello, and welcome to our Pleasant Green Church family and our listeners. This is Minister Leonard Harris, and again, it is our pleasure to share the Word of God with us uh, on this Sunday, July the 26th, 2020. And this is Lesson 8 out of our Faith Pathway Study Manual. Uh, It is from Unit 2, entitled, Wisdom in the Gospels. And this Sunday's lesson uh, is entitled, Finding One's Way. Finding One's Way. And our devotional reading is from the book of Proverbs, the third chapter, verses 13 through 18. And then our background scripture is Proverbs, the third chapter, verses 17, and then the eighth chapter, verses 32 through 36, and also John, the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 14. And our printed passage is John the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 14. And our key verse is John, the 14th chapter, and verse 6. And it reads, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Our lesson's aims are explore the encounter between Jesus and the disciples in the upper room as Jesus told them that he was going away and that they would only later be able to join him in a place he would prepare. Appreciate the difficulty the disciples had in understanding Jesus and Celebrate the promise of Jesus to prepare a place for his followers and to hear and respond to their prayers. And our lesson has three different sections again. Uh, The first one is entitled, Don't Be Troubled, and that will be John, the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 4. Our second one is, We Want to Know the Way, verses 5 through 8. And then our last section is, Just Believe. And that would be the conclusion of the lesson, verses 9 through 14. And so... To expedite time, uh, we're going to get right into the lesson so that we can use it efficiently. And so the very beginning part of our lesson, verses 1 through 4, again, the subtitle for this period of our lesson is called Don't Be Troubled. And first I would like to lift from that Uh, why the commentary may have selected that heading uh, for the lesson or for this portion of the lesson. And so we first understand that preceding chapter 14, that in the previous chapter of 13, that there were some different uh, events Uh, different things that took place. And uh, as a result of those things, Christ understood that the disciples uh, were somewhat puzzled or overwhelmed or they were confused. And uh, to try and calm their spirit and to ease their mind, uh, he opens in the beginning of chapter 14, 
uh, by telling them to not let their hearts be troubled and to reaffirm to them that if you believe in God, believe also in me. And when we look at this, uh, the things that transpired so uh, first, uh, he identified the betrayer, uh, Judas, and then uh, second, he explains to them that he was going to leave. And then finally, he identifies the denial of Peter. And so we have some mixed emotions, and sometimes we understand uh that in our own personal lives and uh, in diff different settings that um, we may hear of three or four or five different uh, proposals or uh, there may be uh, three, four or five different incidents that are occurring are things that we need to take note of and sometimes it can cause us to be uh, distracted or it might uh, uh, mislead our thought process and uh, then when a, another task or another proposal is rendered uh, as we're juggling through our thought process uh, sometimes it's hard for us to uh, uh, retain the information or it may be uh, a challenge to try to resolve the information that we've received. And so we might be, uh, sometimes we may have to ask a question and say, pardon me, but um, you, you just said so and so and so and I'm trying to figure out now, was that relative to the other comment that you made, or was that uh, connected to the other uh, uh, assignment that you lifted, or I, I'm trying to connect the dots. And so uh, it somewhat gives us a understanding and uh, an insight into how the disciples may have been a little bit bewildered and a little bit confused. And, and Christ understanding this first, uh, of course, tries to calm everyone down. Uh, let's all be on the same page. Tries to regain their focus and uh, reaffirm to them uh, what they have seen. Uh, try to get them to recognize and realize what they believe and bring reassurance back to their mind. Now, the focus out of the first section here speaking to a prepared place. Christ is leaving and he's going to prepare a place for his followers. And I want to uh, address that uh, in uh, 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 several scriptural passages to reaffirm this. Um, um, well, first of all, uh, we want to say that, uh, and I believe this is lifted in the commentary, and sometimes we say this ourselves just in our regular uh, speech and conversation with each other that heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people and so uh, that's uh, kind of like a common cliche that we use in our conversation um, but I wanted to address this here uh, from another perspective uh, just to reaffirm that certainly that heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people and that Christ has gone and prepared a place for his followers. And so I wanted to look at this, though, 
uh, from the book of Acts. And uh, it is the 16th chapter, I'm sorry, the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. And I'm going to begin at the 24th verse. Uh, so Acts, the 17th chapter, and I'll begin the reading at the 24th verse. And it reads, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needs anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that he might, that they might feel for him or grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Now I want to lift that and uh, here uh, Paul is actually speaking uh, to the people of Greece, Athens, Greece. And uh, he is speaking to them from a site now. And some of you who have been blessed to travel to Greece uh, know that there is a hill that's actually a tourist site in Athens, Greece. There is a hill that is called Oropagus, and it rests below a monument, a structure, an architectural structure, the uh, Parthenon, the Parthenon. And uh, this is where there is a statue that is uh, uh, in honor of of the goddess in Greek, uh, in Greece, uh, Athena, the goddess Athena. Now, this is a part of Greek uh, architectural structure and culture and history. But Paul, as he is addressing this, he is speaking to the Athenians and saying that he recognized that as he was passing through, that he found on an altar, there was an inscription which read, To the Unknown God. And then Paul goes ahead and he begins to recite to them, speak to them the scriptures that we read. And he tells them that although out of ignorance that they worship a God that they don't know, that he is there to proclaim and to declare the God that he does know. And I bring this up because when we speak about a prepared place, that Christ was going to prepare a place for those, his followers, that just as... None of us placed a reservation. Uh, we didn't sign any documents or fill out any forms or anything to that nature uh, to be where we are today. The scripture clearly says that he had made everyone from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And he determined their 
appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. And so since none of us had any decision, had any part in the process of declaring that I want to be born in America, or I choose to be born in South America, or in Australia, or in Africa, or in China, or in India. Since none of us made that request that determined where we would be placed and in what time period, uh, I want to be born uh, in this era. Uh, I would like uh, to come into being at this particular time. Uh, since those things were predetermined and they were already appointed as to where we would be placed and the boundaries had already been set and our timing, uh, sometimes we uh, look at different periods uh, in our society and in the nation and in the world as a whole and we wonder why am I here and sometimes we may even have a desire that we wish we were born at another time and that may be because of the chaos and the havoc that is present but know of a surety that the Spirit of God has already preordained that we are exactly where we are supposed to be at a time that was already predestined and already decided upon before we even knew that we would be where we are. Now, the, the timing again uh, I want to try and move through this uh, with some kind of uh, uh, practice or with some awareness of trying to expedite time and uh, but speaking of time I want to lift this out of the fourth chapter of John and uh, the 23rd and the 24th verse. Uh, and it is a familiar passage, but I think it's appropriate. And it reads, 4th chapter of John, the 23rd verse, and it says, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such worship. God is spirit. And those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. And if there ever was a time for us to be spiritually aware and spiritually conscious and in the spirit, and also seeking truth. Uh, if there was ever a time that truth would be a necessity, essential to our daily being, this is such a time. And so uh, I wanted us, when we uh, recognize the uh, God which is spirit and rel uh, re relative to the place, a prepared place. Um, just as we were speaking about uh, the Parthian that has the uh, statue that is uh, uh, in the Greek culture uh, honoring the goddess Athena, um, we want to also be mindful that we have been subjected to a presentation, a representation of God uh, that has been uh, some that has been very much misleading. 
God has been presented and uh, identified uh, through other cultural representations. Uh, and one that we are probably more familiar with uh, than others is the Renaissance period, where we see God depicted in the artworks of Michelangelo. And we see a presentation of God that now has been personified, that has been humanized, so that maybe others would be more receptive uh, and have greater understanding if they could see God in their own likeness. But God is spirit. And John tells us in the first chapter of John and the 18th verse, it clearly tells us that no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared God, bore witness of God in human form. But God is spirit. Now I lift this because sometimes uh, we are led uh, to believe that there's uh, some, uh, uh, and, and we're looking at the translation, the words that are used to describe the dwelling of God. Uh, but we look at the translations, and the translations use words that are familiar to the human consciousness, and we begin to think of God's dwelling as mansions, and thinking of God's uh, uh, place or God's abode as uh, there are something in the equivalency of buildings and mansions and houses and things of this nature. Uh, but again, we must be cognizant and aware of the fact that no one has seen God at any time. Also, if we would look at uh, the works of Solomon and uh, listen to what Solomon said, and this would be in 1 Kings, the 8th chapter, and verse 27. And, and this is when uh, Solomon is offering a prayer of dedication to the temple that was built. And it says, But will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have built. And then in Second Chronicles, the 6th chapter and the 18th verse, it is again doing one of Solomon's prayers of dedication to the new temple. And he says, but will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house which I have built. I lift this because I want us to have our focus on not a place made by the hands of man. Because clearly Solomon is saying and scripture is saying that there is no dwelling that is large enough to contain the Spirit of God. And as we always uh, uh, have said, that God is everywhere at the same time. And so there is no place that is large enough to contain the Spirit of God because God is everywhere. 
God is in all of God's creation. There is no place where the Spirit of God is not residing, especially in us. Where the, when we read Acts, it said that we were God's offspring. Therefore, the Spirit of God dwells within us as well as also in all of God's creation. Now, the theoreticians and the theologians have uh, uh, defined for us uh, three heavens, uh, one heaven above the clouds and another heaven above the planetary order of God, and then a third heaven that is above the planets and the stars, and this they claim to be the abode of God. But with all of our instrumentation and our innovation and all of our technology, man has not uh, come upon the dwelling of God. But I leave with this relative to this topic simply to say that 1 Corinthians 2 and 9 and this is what we should rest our uh, affirmation upon. And that is that eyes have not seen and ears have not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love God. And that is the place that we will reside with God when we are absent from this physical domain, then our spirit will be present with the Lord. Now our second section entitled, We Want to Know the Way and Just Believe. Our last section, I want to combine those together because the beginning of uh, verse 5, Thomas raised the question and it was uh, uh, lifted in the commentary that uh, Thomas asked the question that the other disciples was already thinking. And so he says to Christ that we want to know the way. Because the Lord had already said unto them in the closing of the first four verses that we had that they knew where he was going and they knew the way. And so Thomas, still somewhat confused, at raises the question, uh, can you show us the way? Can you explain to us where you're going? And Christ, of course, responds by telling them that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I want to uh, confirm that, and I want to address it with the latter part of our lesson, uh, Just Believe. And uh, in uh, Matthew, and I believe this is the uh, 11th chapter of Matthew, the 11th chapter of Matthew and the 4th verse. Uh, this is Christ answering the disciples of John the Baptist who approached Christ asking if he was the one. And here I want to raise this because the latter part of our lesson speaks of the works of Christ and then also Christ identifying that we, the followers of Christ and the disciples of Christ, that we would do even greater works. And so I want to identify what works is Christ speaking of. So uh, first, when we look at the way and the truth and the life, uh, we remember that in the uh, the 10th chapter of John that Christ said that I am come that you might have life 
and have life more abundantly. So Christ was speaking of our present life, but also our eternal life. When we look at then the works to affirm that he is the way and that he is the truth and the life, he tells the disciples of John that tell him of my works. Tell him that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So when we, when we begin to identify the works of Christ and also the way of Christ, I want to raise one other uh, scripture, and that would be out of the sixth chapter of John. The sixth chapter of John. And here we will begin at the 26th verse. And John, the 26th verse, speaking of the life of Christ, and it says that here, now this is after Jesus had fed the 5,000 with the bread and the fish. And he says to them in the 26th verse, he says, most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Then he admonishes them, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. And so when they ask the question of, can you show us the Father? And he responds to them that when you see me, you have seen the Father. For I and my Father are one. Here he's affirming to them that the Father has set his seal, his signature, his approval on Christ as the coming one, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And as we read further, uh, when we come down uh, to the other verses under the sixth chapter, uh, I will uh, identify this here and start at 34. And it says, Then they said to him, Lord, Give us this bread always, because God, Christ had already explained to them that he was the bread of God that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Well, once he explains to them about the spiritual bread, the eternal bread, they make the distinction between the physical bread, and then they say, Give us that bread always. But uh, here is what he says. I am the bread of life. Verse 35. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Here again he's reaffirming. Their uh, confusion. Uh, they're not recognizing who Christ is, although he has been in their midst for three and a half years. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now this affirms what the way is. What's the directive? 
What's the process? How do, how do we fulfill the requirements of what God is asking us? Christ answers that by saying that he didn't come down from heaven to do what he wanted to do. He wasn't fulfilling his own desires, but he was doing the will of the one who sent him. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all of he, I mean, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but shall raise it up at the last day. And so I wanted to address that concerning, uh, okay, well then, uh, how do we know uh, what the will is? How do we know what that way is? Well, then that comes through our submission to God's will over our will. And we have to first recognize we only have a will because God gave us free will to choose. Now, I will close with this, and this will be verse 14, uh, which says, You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. I think we definitely need clarity on that. We need to distinguish it and disassociate it from the prosperity claims and the name it and claim it and materialism and acquisition of things. So I want to do that out of the uh, sixth chapter of Matthew. And I'm going to read this uh, briefly to conclude but in the 6th chapter of Matthew, uh, the 25th verse, it reads, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, or what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Now, when we start affixing that we can ask God for anything, and it says right there in the word that if we ask God, we ask for anything, and we ask it in the name of Christ, that he said he was going to give it to us. Uh, it clearly states here that in that day and time, uh, if there were those and they worried about the mundane things of the day, they worried about eating, they worried about clothing for the body, they worried about where they were going to go. And so Christ relieves that concern and then focuses it towards what we should be worried about. And here is how he concludes that. And this is in. Uh, verse 31 of the same chapter it says, therefore, do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Not worried about uh, fashion and brand names and titles and things of that nature. Uh, but he says, for after all these things, the Gentiles seek, the non-believers seek after these things, those that don't know the true God. He says, for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. But what God refer, what God requests, what God uh, asks of us is that we first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So uh, as we look 
especially in the time and era we are in. And this, of course, is not for all people. But we look at uh, some celebrities or people that are in the social media or the limelight, and we see all the things that they have. And sometimes we wonder, why are they so unhappy? Why are they so disgruntled? Why are they so unsatisfied? They have everything. So clearly, it tells us that things don't bring joy. They might bring temporary, momentary happiness, but they don't sustain joy. The things that are relegated to the building of God's kingdom, these things settle the mind, settle the soul, reaffirm the spirit, build up encouragement. These things please God. So I would like to close and hopefully uh, something has been lifted uh, in the lesson that reaffirms us, that builds us up, that encourages us and prepares us to do God's will. And we uh, again say that when we fizzle, finish this physical domain, we are absent from this body and present with the Lord in the place that he has prepared for his followers. God bless you and God keep you.